Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, I start this episode with uh, a typical question that I ask everybody who comes on. What does the idea of uh, Vietnam being Vietnamese mean to you? Uh, what does being Vietnamese mean to me? It's funny that you asked that. Um, I guess it all depends on when you ask that and what age. Um, for me, I guess growing up in Orange County, uh, being a minority, being younger and uh, being Vietnamese, I think when you're younger, you don't really appreciate being Vietnamese as much as you would when you get older. An example would be like, you know, bringing different lunches to school, eating me goi chips instead of regular potato chips, yeah. things like that is a little different. So growing up, I, I think uh, most kids wouldn't appreciate um, the culture as much. But um, as I got older, um, I really appreciated uh, being Vietnamese. And what it means to me is uh, being very uh, resilient, being a hard worker, a uh, person that doesn't give up, uh, especially all the things that uh, our ancestors have gone through. Um, that's one thing I definitely learned through my family, my grandparents, for sure. What are you wearing right now? Downtown. I'm wearing an Albi. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are you wearing right I, now? Uh, it's our it's our New Year. It was yeah. loaned to me by our mutual friend Tam. Um, uh, we were just on a, a little talk show this morning, so I decided to keep it on for the podcast. Represent. Shout out to Thumb. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's an amazing guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what uh, you? It was on loan. What What did you do with Thumb? Uh, what this morning? Uh, we were on a Good Day LA. Uh, for a, a few segments. Uh, it was live, and it was basically going through um, the things that we're doing this weekend, the uh, operations that we've been doing since the pandemic, um, about the meals that we serve to, you know, not only Vietnamese seniors, but any seniors or anyone that's, you know, high risk or unemployed due to COVID or facing hardships. Uh, we decided to come together as uh, business professionals and help the community. I can't wait to get into that. That's going to be yeah. um, awesome. But I want to get into a few points of your life before we even get to that. Growing up Vietnamese, and you say bringing lunches, uh, didn't you grow up in a predominantly Vietnamese community in Orange County? I mean, bringing lunch to that kind of like world would be accepted though, right? Or no? Yeah. Um, well, I, I was born uh, in Los Angeles, Glendale, and I went to school in Rosemead, I believe, until second or third grade. Then uh, my family moved to Fountain Valley. And um, going to school here, you know, being the new person, I didn't have very many friends. And, uh, you know, bringing my mom's lunch, like fried rice instead of your sandwich, you know, you get a little criticism. I wouldn't say it's racism, but more criticism. Yeah. On the playground, um, you made friends in elementary school, right? Um, yes. Five guys I've heard, uh, I've read. Can you tell me about that story? It's a, it's a funny story. Totally true. Everyone asks, like, how true is it? It's 100% completely true. The very first uh, four friends I met in uh, elementary school are the four friends I opened up the restaurant with today, uh, hence the name Recess. Um, I've always been in the restaurant business since, uh, you know, my mom and dad. Um, but my friends and I, we've always have been into craft beer, uh, fun foods. We love to go out to eat pretty much like everybody. And we decided to open up a really a crafty gastropub, if you will. And uh, when we were playing around with the names, you know, why not call it Recess? Because we all met in Fountain Valley and we opened in Fountain Valley, and probably about one mile from where the restaurant is. Are you guys still, five of you, <clears throat> still together? Yeah, I mean, uh, they were just here a, a minute ago. Like, we're, we're more than best friends. We're a true brotherhood. Wow, so the five of you still operate this business? <clears throat> yeah, we still operate together. We still hang out together pretty much every day. Too much, if you will. <laughs> All right, we're going to get into this right now. I find that to be miraculous, right? Because I've uh, had businesses that had one partner, two partner. It was an absolute nightmare to have even just one partner. I can't even get along with myself sometimes, let alone have a partner, right? How do you make five people work together so well after all these years? Um I think it's not just for a restaurant business, it's for any business. Make sure that you divvy up the uh, responsibilities very, very clear from the get-go. And the great thing about uh, my friends and I, um, I'm the only one that has the restaurant experience. So coming into it, they're just like, Viet, just do you, do what your family has taught, taught you, and we'll just roll with it, you know? And do you guys ever fight? Do you guys ever argue? No, never. And did not those really. guys drop whatever they were doing to work full-time with you? Oh, no, no. So I'm the only person that actually works here. The rest are just pretty much investors. They uh, hang out. 
uh, once it's Friday night, everyone comes out. You know, where it's like the cheers team. Everyone's happy that you came. You came, and everyone's you know knows your name. Got it. Got it. So when did you open up? <clears throat> we opened up about I want to say four and a half years ago. And who came up with the concept of it? Well, uh, originally it was my idea. I was. Uh, I've always had a dream to open up a gastropub where we serve craft beer, craft cocktails, and really fun, exciting foods. And I'm, I'm the type of person I'm extremely obsessive, and that's all I think about until I get it. So this uh, style of restaurant, or this, uh, this idea has been in the works for over 10 years. I've talked about it since I was in college, and uh, it was a huge dream of mine. And um, so they all know about it just as much as I do because I, I just talk about it all the time. And so once we got closer, they all wanted to invest. And, you know, why not? We see each other every single day and we're always around each other. So why not work together? What kind of restaurant did your parents have growing up? Growing up, um, all, uh, many. We had pho restaurants. We had Chinese fast food takeout. Um, but the one that I grew up with longest is definitely uh, my mom's vegetarian restaurant. I believe she was the first vegetarian restaurant in all of Orange County. Uh, she opened it, I want to say, in 87. Uh, 1987 yeah and it was uh the first like you know mainstream vietnamese vegetarian uh restaurant now my mom and my family were not completely vegetarians um we are buddhist but we wanted to provide an outlet for buddhist uh vietnamese people or people that eat during rem you know the vegetarian uh time that you should eat you should eat vegetarian food um you had nowhere to go and if you're eating vegetarian you're eating like the basics um you know you're eating like me goi you know or you're eating like just random things just to get past the day. So we decided to create a restaurant that's, uh, you know, wholesome, really good. And it's not about missing meat. It's about, you know, vegetables and, and healthy food. Yeah. What What is rum? Rum is, uh, I want to, I don't want to say it's like a, the each month there's rum. So it's like the full moon. And for Buddhists, that's the day that you eat uh, vegetarian. So it's about once a month. Once a month you eat rum. So rum is sort of like um day, the day. So it's like a full moon day. The, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I never heard of that. I mean, I've heard of the yeah. word, but I never heard that that's like sort of like this traditional kind of thing that, I mean, I'm, I grew up a Catholic, so I didn't know. Yeah. So for younger generations, uh, most people don't stick to it. Most people don't even know that day. But growing up uh, in my mom's restaurant, that's all I hear. Oh, it's Ram coming up. We're going to be very, very busy. And that's where the older generation all congregate to eat, you know, vegetarian meals. Yeah. What do you yeah. think you learned from growing up in a, a, a Vietnamese restaurant um, family? What did I learn? That you don't have days off. <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, you don't have days off. You work around the clock. But it's rewarding if you have passion for it. Yeah. And um, knowing that, why would you even, you know, jump into something? It's a hard life not having a day off, yeah. right? Funny that you say that. Um, I, when I was in college, I want to say when I was about 20 years old, 19 years old or something, I started my own notary company, a mobile notary company. So I do, um, I still do it today, right? But I hate doing it. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> I hate doing mobile notary. So we do it for uh, mortgage companies. Um, I'm not a notary myself. We outsource, outsource all of our work. So if you have a loan signing in New York and your client's there, you don't know the notaries out there, you call my company and we handle that. So I, I did that. I've done that since I was like 19 or 20 years old. Um, it's a really successful business. Um, I, I hope to do it for the rest of my life, but it provided me no self-like gratification. I wasn't happy with what I did. I got to a point where I didn't even show, go to work anymore because it was self-sustaining. Uh, I would travel a lot. Um, we'll get into that too. I love traveling to Vietnam, but I would travel all the time. And every time I come back from my travels, I would be like, I don't want to go to work. I, it's so boring. I, it's so monotonous. It's the same thing over and over. And it's, it's, you know, there's no gratification for me. Um, Money-wise, it was awesome. You know, So that's uh, two different things. Am I going to work for the dollar or am I going to work for myself, self-fulfillment? Uh, and so one day I just decided, you know, like I'm really into uh, food um, growing up with my family's restaurant. And I decided, you know, I want to test on what I can do. I'm a really huge foodie. I love to travel to eat. I feel like I've been to all the cool restaurants around the world, you know, and um, that's what I really love to do. So that's where it came about. I understood that I would be working my butt off around the clock, but it's something that I wake up wanting to go to work. So as cliche as it sounds, 
I don't feel like I'm working seven days a week, even though I'm here seven days a week. I, I've gone through a similar uh, experience. It's actually the reverse of what you've gone through. My family business was window coverings. And we have, uh, we still have the factory in Vietnam and I still have it just like you still have the notary. I couldn't wait to get out of that business and it's self-sufficient. It's on its own now, but I have the same feeling that you have about the notary business. It's like we were doing celebrity homes and we were in high end homes and I couldn't be more miserable. Couldn't be more miserable. And then I got into food and I was like, Oh my God, I'm home. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's it's a rough line of work though you know like food the food business can be brutal because you're you're wearing a lot of different hats right yeah mm-hmm. yeah what so uh, the cool yeah go ahead, go ahead go ahead i was gonna say the cool thing about recess room and that's different from i want to say the cliche casual pho restaurant because you're running off similar margins as your competitor we don't have a real competitor it's because no one serves this food that we serve um so like a lot of the things we do, we can't compare it to, oh, XYZ restaurant has it. Why are they charging five times as much? No one has the stuff that we're serving. And that's what creates a recess room um, excitement. And that's why people come. They're always wanting to see what we're doing next. And so we're always trying to push the buttons. But at the same time, that creates a lot of pressure on me too. Like we're always trying to think of newer, fun things. One thing on your menu is the, pig, <clears throat> the pig's head. How the yeah. hell did you come up with that? So a uh, funny story with that is like when we were um, testing um, the food for uh, before we we're opening, you know, I would have family members be like, why are you selling a pig head? Like, just look at it. It's disgusting. You see its teeth, you see its ears, you open its uh, jowls, you'll see its brain. And I said, I looked at it. I was like, this is so fun. This is so exciting. I can't imagine, um, you know, going out to eat with a group of my friends and having a few beers and having a fried pig head and eating it with tacos or whatever the sides would be. Um, but my, my uncles and aunts were like, this is disgusting. This looks crazy. And when I looked at that, I knew what my target market was. I knew that the people that would be dining at Recess Room would be similar to me around my age, uh, young business professionals looking to go out, looking to take their friends out for a fun night out. And that's exactly right. what Recess is about. So the pig head, how we came up with it is it's a product that people often trash. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of cultures that eat it, especially uh, Mexicans, uh, Hispanics, you know, they, and our, one of our chefs is Hispanic. So the way he did it and the way we're doing it now is like an al pastor style. So it's basically eating al pastor tacos with carnitas meat. It's just, it comes out in a whole pig head and then we can chop it up for you. But seriously, if you were to close your eyes and you eat it, you're like, this is an amazing taco. And it's the fun factor of being at recess. Uh, can you explain al pastor? Because I never really understood. I always thought al pastor was on a spit, right? But then how do you put a yeah. pig- I mean, am, I, am I getting this concept wrong? Yeah, so the Alba store is on a spit, uh, typically with uh, pork meat, but it's um, the marinade. So like pineapple, achiote, you know, spices, bay leaves, things like that. So it's the the mix, Got the sauce. It. Got so it. we make uh, the pig in that, and we also fry it, and then we brush it with Alba store sauce. Do you ever get criticism for the pig's head? Yeah, like, all the time. Like, all the time. And it's funny that you should say that. I believe it was last year we had um, uh, animals right, rights activists uh, protest in front of our restaurant for, I, I think, like three weeks. It was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And their main goal was to... Holy bring, shit. Main, main goal was to um, tell our guests to d- don't go there, you know, because we have a huge patio. They were out there with their loudspeakers. They were saying, this is cruel, this and this and that. I'm not here to debate what's cool or what's not. I came from a family background that we ate no meat. And the funny thing is most of the, a lot of the protesters I recognized since I was a little kid because they eat at my family's restaurant. Oh my. <laughs> but the, the funny thing is, uh, personally, I'm not here to debate what's right or wrong, but if you're eating regular pork, you know, you're throwing away the head. At least I respect the animal enough to utilize all of it. So that's how I see it. I, I would see like anyone that utilizes all the complete animal provides it, that gives it the most respect that you can instead of cutting the most prime meats of it and throwing away all the other trash meats that no one wants. We take trash meat and we make something very fun and exciting for it. You know, that's a, a big debate, right? Like uh, animal rights. Group. I have, I feel it. I feel I can relate to, you know, not putting pain, ex- excessive pain for animals. And I, I do side on the, on the side of, um, cruelty uh, of anti-cruelty and not putting animals in this pain and ultimately to death and if we can grow this stuff in the lab i mean let's why not do it right but at the same time there's this whole like 
other sort of way of thinking um, on a basic primal level. We uh, existed in Vietnam or in Mexico or wherever, uh, eating certain foods. And why is it that now um, these things are so taboo for us to do? I, don't, I find it unfair sometimes. Right. Totally. I totally agree. When I go to Vietnam, I'm eating, you know, um, uh, the, co the, same. Of, yeah, the coconut girls. I, I don't know the name of it, but I'm eating all of the, the cool things. But I appreciate it is because that's our culture. Uh, if you go to like a certain region, this is what they grew up eating. You know, I'm not here to knock on what they eat. I'm here to experience um, their lifestyle and appreciate what they what they know and what they see. Yeah, I mean, there's a debate of, um, you know, eating dogs. Right. Yeah. There's a big debate in a country like Korea, China, Vietnam, that people ate dogs traditionally for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, and I understand dogs are so close to us and I've owned dogs and I I respect uh, the idea of having a dog as a domesticated pet. But the other the, the other cultural side exists. It's like, OK, well, that was this, a food that sustained people for for many years. What's your position mm -hmm. on that? For eating uh, dogs, or like or the idea of position, taboo, you know, things are like very taboo. Like, oh, a tikan is another one, you know, duck coagulated duck blood. Yes, yeah. one of my favorite dishes. <laughs> one of my favorite dishes. I, I, for me, my stance on that is that you can't criticize a culture that you're not in. You know, if you're not from that area, you can't, you can't be like, why are you doing this? Every culture has its own weirdness, and uh, that's one thing about. You know, to be honest, if we stop criticizing other cultures, we would all get along much more. Love so it. that's yeah. where my stance is. Let yeah. do their thing, you know. And for the record, I think you know um, that because I'm inside the culture. I think that does need to stop. Um, you know, it's just for the record. But uh, you know, I, it's always a, a a cultural debate. You know, for people in those cultures, it's like, well, well, we're coming in with a Western kind of view or a colonial view that, hey, stop doing that. It's wrong. But then it's like, wait a minute. They've been doing it in their land forever. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, well, let's talk about thikkan because that is something I make that I can. You make that? I've, ne I've never uh, made that in my life. I know how it's made. I've never seen it. Uh, but that's one of my favorite dishes, to be honest. I love uh, wine yaos because that's like one of my favorite dishes to eat. I put a ton of lime, a lot of chilies, a lot of herbs, and that's all I need. I eat that all, all right. the time. We we just stepped into a um, we just stepped into a a high end car right now. You and I we're just going for a long ride with this uh, nyao debate, this nyao topic because this is like one of my favorite all time uh -huh. topics about food. And especially this uh, department of food in the Vietnamese culture, um, this idea of quang yao, right? Like, how did you begin eating yao know, foods? If you have this passion and love for it so much, when did you get started? I think, I think uh, all the Vietnamese kids grow up in uh, eating uh, yao food at one point in their lives, uh, especially at sporting events, New Year events. That's just what we do. That's what our people do. If uh, if I go to Vietnam like today. You know, I'm not going to be going into those fancy air conditioning restaurants. I'm looking for the lang up. I'm looking for the little alleyways that I'm going to eat, like, bun, uh, what do you call it? Uh, bun bok ching. I'm going to be eating, like, weird things, you know? So that's what I enjoy. And that's what I feel is about our culture, you know? So I, I love uh, Nyo Nyao. It's the best. And, and the variety of the types of dishes that we have, you know, look, we, I grew up uh, with my dad saying to me, it's like, all right, uh, the, 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 the culture, the, 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 the reading and writing, the, the elegance or the, the beauty of the, the words that we can express, you know, th our thoughts in Vietnamese is a beautiful thing. But I'll tell you what's even more, more in Vietnamese we call feng fu, mean, means it's more lush, uh, is the food scene for, for Vietnam, right? And the variety that you see in you know, foods, it's so massive. Right. Like whoever thought, want, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I want to say uh, Recess Room is a very, very close Don Yao restaurant that's not just Vietnamese. Um, our food style is very, very crafty where you want to you drink. Don Yao food makes you want to do that. You want to pop up some Heineken's and take shots of Hennessy. That's what Vietnamese people do. But at Recess Room, we design our food to where you're eating it and you're just like, man, I, I want an IPA. 
or you know i want an old-fashioned we think about like how to pair yeah, the yeah. food with the yeah the same thing food. so it's american california style donia or restaurant oh wow well, that's a great description yeah it takes up you you raise up the uh the you the, the the thought process of 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 you know food um and you know really is a a drinking a drinking a drinking food right it's a drinking yeah culture. definitely and that's what our restaurant's about one hundred percent the so let me uh, tell you some of the items that we do that it kind of reminds you of like you know food so we serve like a we call it beef chicharrones it's like uh, it looks like um yeah hail fried right but it's not pig skin it's beef tendon it's super oh, wow. uh, or it takes like two days to make completely. You basically make a beef tendon, you render it down, cook it down for like six hours and um, six hours. And then your, um, your, uh, sorry, someone just came and okay. threw off my track. You, you cook it down for like six hours. Then you have to freeze it to get it really, really hard. You shave it super, super thin. Then you dehydrate it and then you're able to fry it. So it takes like two days to, to work that out. Once you fry it, it looks just like a pig skin, right? Uh, chicharron. But, People ask, like, why would you do uh, that instead of, um, you know, doing all that labor? That shows the care and love that we have for the restaurant and our food. So it comes out looking just like a pig skin, but it's actually made out of beef tendon. So it's an art, uh, artful dish, if you will. Where did you learn that? Uh, through our chefs. A lot of technique and through our chefs. And they showed it to me. And I was like, this is something I definitely want on the menu. We've had it ever since we've opened. Yeah, that's a very creative thing. You have a lot of creative juices in you, um, like an artist. You, you you can recognize, you know, some sort of expressive way to express the food, right? right. Where, where did that come from? You know, I don't know. Like, it's growing up, uh, I think it's because we go out to eat so much. And being in Orange County, like every corner you look, you're looking at a different ethnicity. You're looking at a different style of restaurant. And I'm one that gets bored easily. So I don't want to be eating the same thing every single day. So for me, I'm like... I want to eat Peruvian this day. I want to eat Ethiopian. I love Indian food. That's actually one of my favorite foods, Indian food and Indian like culture and their, their curries and their dal, amazing food to me. So like, I love Indian style food. So that's where like it comes from. I have a love for all different ethnicities and cultures. Yeah. You know, going back to like the gun, right? It's like, whoever thought that, you, yeah. could, you know, collect the blood of a, of a duck put yeah. it in a bowl and then you know you have to put ning mom in it so it doesn't coagulate right away yeah whoever thought about this stuff so that technique is really interesting i i it's very very creative but i do see why they ate big gun it's because we don't waste anything we don't we u- utilize every single thing and especially to, uh different cultures they utilize all the bone we grind up the bone to put it in fertilizer you know we take the fur we, we use every part of the animal and that's giving the animal the most respect that you can think of like i'm not saying anything wrong like how we do things in america but what do we take out of a uh, let's say a cow or a chicken we just take the prime meats and we throw away everything else we don't like utilize everything for like chicken or you know cow feed or whatever but in vietnam you utilize every single part of the animal and i think that's the way it should be especially for the environment you know that's a real good distinction with the vietnamese culture i i'm glad that we're discussing that very point that we don't waste it i never thought yeah. about that you know that question that line of questions like i always like well like who sat down and devised this idea of like cutting the you know the neck open and draining the blood and but you're right like they there's there's so much to this idea of not wasting anything right just like eating a uh, week right who thought about making blood cubes mm. you know you just don't want to waste uh any part of the animal you know, so that's kind of interesting. I grew up hating eating wheat, but then now, like, I enjoy it. It's weird how uh, your taste buds change. It, it is. I love wheat. I love <laughs> having an extra bowl of wheat in my Bumba way. I always order, like, an extra. Every restaurant I ever go to for Bumba way, I always extra order the extra wheat. I don't know what it is about wheat or tikan that just really does it for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Let's go back to uh, your school. You know, when you were in school, what did you study? Um, so I, I grew up, uh, I moved here. Um, I graduated in Fountain Valley High School. I actually moved, I lived in Florida for quite some time going to boarding school and uh, playing tennis. So my grandfather wanted me to become a tennis, uh, professional tennis player. So I grew up playing that every single day for the longest time since probably third grade into almost high school. And I never enjoyed it. I just did it because that's what he wanted me to do. 
Um, I did that my whole life and I never really enjoyed it. But I moved, I lived in Florida for a good four years. Then I came back and I went to uh, Cal State Long Beach to study marketing. So that's where uh, my background is. Wait a minute. So you became like the direction that you're going is to become a tennis pro in high school. Yeah, it's so weird. Yeah. So I grew up playing tennis my whole life and I was the only one able to escape my family's like, oh, you have to come to the restaurant seven days a week because all I was doing was playing tennis. My brother and my sister were like living at the restaurant with my family, my, my parents, but I got to travel with my grandfather to play tournaments, to live in Florida. I lived in San Diego for a while and Ojai for a while. And this is all during high school years. So I was all, all over. Well, why you? Why not the other two? I don't know. I guess I was his favorite, <laughs> but, but this, it was just me. I just, I was always with my grandfather and he drove me to play tennis every single day. And I would play at like 6 AM and then on and off school until like 7 PM. It was like a whole day ordeal. And it was like almost 365 days a week. I mean a year for like 10 years at least. And whose idea was it to, to groom you into this tennis pro? Uh, definitely my grandfather's for sure. He he grew up loving it and, you know, he never had the opportunity to play it that much when he was younger and he wanted it for me. And so that's what I just did. Yeah. And was there this pressure to become a tennis pro? Oh, tremendous, tremendous pressure. And uh, that's one of the things that I never want to put on my own kids. Um, but I, I want like my, my kids to grow up doing what they want to do as long as they work really, really hard. I don't care if they want to be a gymnast, an Olympian or, or, you know, a salesperson. I, I don't care as long as they have passion, they love it because I, I feel like I love what I do, even though, you know, there's so much going on with the pandemic and restaurant business, this and that. Um, but yet we still open up another restaurant right now. And people ask why it's just, it's just what I love to do. It might not make financial perfect sense, but I feel there's a way to win in every game that you play. It's just, are you resilient and smart enough? You know, and I feel maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but I'm not willing to quit. You know, this idea of um, having our grandparents or our parents pressure us into direction, right? I talk about this a lot with the guests and friends of mine. Um, I, and it's like, I guess I'm asking this because I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I kind of like went through my own metamorphosis and careers and changes uh, with the work that I do. I always feel like without the pressure of some external force, like a parent or growing up really poor or whatever, we as human beings don't sort of like get to value the lessons of what hard work or diversity in, 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 in our experiences. We, we, we're not able to kind of like fully grip the challenges ahead. Now, do you think the, the the tennis influence of your grandfather and what he wanted you to do has an effect in a good or bad effect on the rest of your life because you went through that 10 years? 100%. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Hmm. I would say if it wasn't for my father or him forcing me to do something with, you know, tremendous like discipline, I don't know what type of person I would be. Um, I learned to be that way. And I learned how to focus. I learned how to compete. Um, that's all we did compete like every weekend and play tournaments like crazy. I learned how to compete and, you know, respect what you do and understand that there's always more and there's always someone out there that's better than you. And so I learned to be humble. I learned to compete and I learned to be, I, I want to say a man you know, through that. And was he kind of heartbroken when at some point you had to tell him, Hey, grandfather, grandpa, I'm not down with this or. You know, I think uh, maybe at first, but he saw me um, bloom into a, a different person. And I think uh, he was proud of that. He was proud of like what the product of playing tennis every single day created. And I think he was able to see that um, as much as I did. How do you know if you're good or not? I mean, is it a ranking thing or like, and I asked this in more broad implications with your quality of your food, the quality of the direction of in your, your life. How do you know at a young age, if you are qualified to play as a pro one day, is that going through your mind? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's all about rankings. It's all about tennis tournaments. And at that age, playing tennis like that is, I, I want to say, I don't want to say detrimental at a point, but it put, puts so much pressure on young kids that might not be ready for it, myself uh, included. Um, but all it is is just competing day in and day out. And it comes to a point where you're almost numb to competition. Like you don't even care whether it's a win or a loss. You're just ready to go out there and be the best that you can. So eventually that's where you, you come to fruition. But yeah, it's not a, a ranking system. 
did you ever think that uh, you're good enough to like get to the top? I, I figured, I think at, when I was like around 16 or 17, I, I figured that, you know, I'm not good enough to actually make a career out of it. Um, but I, it's not something that I actually ever enjoyed to do. So I never really thought about that that much. I, all I thought about was I'm playing this every single day for the rest of my life because that's what my grandfather wanted me to do. And he was uh, my role model, my idol. So that's all I, I wanted to please him. You know? Yeah. At 16 or 17, having that realization, what did it come from like, oh, well, maybe I didn't have a passion for it. And therefore, I'm not going to ever be good and be able to be making money from it. Or it was just like, oh, my God, I'm trying as hard as I can, but I just can't make the shots or I can't do the thing that I need to do to win consistently. Therefore, I'm not going to pursue this as a career. Yeah, it's more on the, the latter part. I think my grandfather pushed me a lot because when I was younger, um, the learning curve was like fast for me. And it got to a point where, you know, people caught up and, and my learning curve like slowed down. So that's where I noticed was like, you know, maybe this isn't for me, you know. And if I had a choice on what I would have uh, wanted to play, I would have played soccer or basketball for sure. Mm -hmm. I love those sports, you know, and I wish that he pushed me towards that because, you know, I would have probably learned the same things. It's just I would have enjoyed doing what I did. Yeah. Is he still around, your grandfather? No, he passed away. And what did he do for, you know, did he was he a tennis player? Or? Uh, no, he wasn't a tennis player. He was in journalism. Uh, in Vietnam. And your parents didn't have anything to do with like, you know, no. jumping in and saying, hey, daddy, stop. Daddy, stop. My son doesn't want to play. You know, like your mom, dad didn't jump in. And no, they just wanted to do whatever my grandfather wanted to do. We all look at him as like the, the main person. So, yeah. And plus my, my mom and my dad were very immersed in their own world doing the restaurant businesses. Um, and at one point they were doing like three or four vegetarian restaurants just in Westminster. So it was, it was a lot of work. So they were very immersed, you know. Holy cow. So when they had you come to them and saying, you know, Many years before you even did recess, uh, and you're like, I want to get into the business. Did, were, did they approve of this? What did they think? Well, th during that time, my dad already passed away. So it was just uh, my mom. And she was very happy with the way my notary business was going. She's like, just do this for the rest of your life. And I'm like, no way on earth will I just, just do this. This is like, I'll, I'll live such a meaningless life. I'll be bored out of my mind. And I wouldn't be proud to tell like my kids that oh your dad was a notary uh, person <laughs> you know what I mean like there's no fun into that you know but um but when I told my mom that I wanted to open up a recess room she was originally thinking that it was going to be a small sandwich joint or whatnot she was like okay um sure just go ahead and do what you want to do but when she saw the the place the place that we got she was very uh trying to talk me out of it because it's it's over uh, 6,500 square feet. It's bigger. It used to be a Coco's built, really huge restaurant. And um, it's a huge taking. And my mom was just th thinking like, you know, what experience do you have besides growing up being in the restaurant business? Right. And uh, for me, I, I always thought that I'm very resilient and we learn along the way, but I, I felt like I had a very strong uh, business plan, a solid business plan. And we, we just followed it and um, it worked out very well for us, except until, you know, all this craziness happened, you know? Yeah. yeah. And when you say your business plan, like, you figured out the the dollars and cents of it, right? The concept and everything. Like, where in your mind did you say, "Okay, this is going to this is going to to take place, and this is going to be a reality"? Because anybody can plan shit and put it together, but how did you know that you had the right stuff to do this? <clears throat> To be honest, um, well, for one, you just have to believe in yourself. But second, you never know. You never really know until you, you risk it. You never know. Um, and that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it exciting. And that's what provides or actually puts pressure on you to make sure that you keep working so you would kind of know. But in the end, you don't really know. Um, for me, uh, having a restaurant, you can have the best business plan. You can have the best dollars and cents set up and everything. But if customers don't come in, all of the stuff that you provided doesn't mean anything. You know, so the most important thing, in my opinion, is if the customers want to come through the door, if they want to come through the door, you can figure all that other stuff later. You know, it, you can figure that, that stuff along the way. But uh, the most important goal is do people like your food? Do people want to come to your restaurant? Do they want to be there? What is it? You know, if you can't fill it up, then it doesn't matter if you're the best business person in the world. You can't get people to come in then no one's going to spend a dollar. Yeah, I mean, I'm asking all of these questions because it's a selfish kind of reflection for me. You know, I had two restaurants myself in 97 and again in 2017, 20 years after the first. And they didn't 
uh, survived. The first one, I handed it off to family and, you know, they, they did rent it for a few more years. I went back to school. And then the second one, I had about f- almost two years and um, it, it was hard, man. It was hard. And you have this idea that, and that's why I asked you that question. It's like, you have this concept of like doing something like a restaurant and you, you're passionate, but when you put it together, I mean, you finally get it built and you, you know, your food's flying out the kitchen. It's not what you think it is. Yeah, correct. 100%. It's not what you think it is. Um, but I, I guess like you, you have to be able to be uh, always looking at the glass half full and find your your happiness along the way. You find uh, your dollars and cents. You find your tweaks along the way. But I, I think for us, we have like daily meetings with our staff and figure out what we can do today that's better than what we did yesterday. Whether it be, hey, today we only sold five old fashions and that's a certain percentage of the customers that came in. Can we up it a couple of percentages? And if we can, how are we going to do that? That's just one example of what we do daily. And I feel that's what makes it fun for the staff because every single day they're playing a, uh, another game in their mind. Instead of just coming to work and be like, all right, I'm just do what I do monotonous monotonously and uh, just go with the flow every single day that the staff come here they they have a new game that they're playing so I feel it makes it new for everybody yeah did you um have you strayed much from the original concept oh um I don't want to say uh we didn't move away we uh we we morphed into something better you know um things that have changed like we we, we thought that we we're just going to do like, let's say an Asian style picket. Let's just use the picket as an example. Right. Um, but it's changed to so many different ways. Like we're doing it Mexican style. I think next uh, couple of weeks we're doing Hawaiian style. We've done Korean style where you serve a Sam style with like the veggies, tofu dip, you know, samjong and all that stuff. And uh, that's what makes it fun. Um, but it's not just that pig head. It's all the dishes that we do that creates that fun, lively atmosphere. Um, the, our best-selling dish right now is our birria taco. Are you familiar with a birria taco? Yeah. So you're from LA, right? I'm from LA, yeah. So LA, you know, it's huge, you know. But down here in Orange County, like, you really have to search for a birria taco. Like, I don't know anywhere, like, around here with a five-mile radius that I can, I can get one. But it's such a simple taco that's so popular, and it's taken, like, LA, New York by storm, right? Um, but one of our most can popular dishes... Can you tell me, can you tell us what it is so other people know about it? Yeah, so a birria taco is like you uh, you just take a corn uh, tortilla, just dip it in some uh, you know oil fat, and you put it on the uh, plancha flat flat grill, and then um, you have um, you know meat inside, uh, a cheese that melts like mozzarella or we use Oaxaca cheese, and uh, you put some you know uh, onion cilantro in it, and you dip it. the The fun part of it is it's pan fried like a crispy quesadilla mm-hmm. that's small, but you dip it into a meat jus. Right. And that's what makes it really, really fun. But what we do differently and that's really popular for here is we did the same exactly same setup. However, we cook the meat as if we cook bomba way exactly to the teeth. Right. So the meat comes out all lemongrassy, all spicy. We even put mambrook in the, the mix. So we cook it till it's fork tender. And then we use the jus to dip the meat in. So you're dipping into bomba way, like super lemongrassy, spicy. I'm salivating just talking about it. But Nothing against the real Hispanic version, but the Vietnamese version has so much more aromatics, so much more spice, lemongrass, all that stuff. So when Vietnamese people eat it, they're like, they know right away. But we don't put it on the menu. That's what we do. So we even have Hispanics coming here and telling us that we make the best birria taco they've ever had. And we're Asian, you know? That's mind-blowing. That's, yeah. that's crazy to think about. No, we don't put it on the menu that it's Bumba Way birria, but it is, you know? Yeah. The process of making that um, is very Vietnamese. And, you know, it made, it made me think about, uh, you ever heard of Umami Burger? The chain? Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. so when they first came out, they were on La Brea in Holly, in, by Hollywood in L.A. Um, and they had their first uh, joint there. And I was like, I, we, my family and I, we went there maybe once a month and we loved it. But they made it a big thing where, uh, for some reason, they really touted the fact that they use nook mum in that patty Mm -hmm. and i think that was like the first time i had people probably did it before but that was like the first time i realized nook mum was in the umami uh patty Uh burger patty Mm -hmm. that they use and then you would see on their website uh, years later i think they were affiliated with uh a brand of nook mum that uh that's that's really popular i can't remember which brand but you realize like the influence of the vietnamese culture in something so Americanized. 
mind blowing. Like yeah. we're so, yeah. So we we don't do that just to make things Vietnamese fusion. We just know what the flavors that we're trying to hit a lot. Another item that we do that's really really fun um, uh, is we do a bone marrow pot pie, but we don't put that. It's actually baka in it. So we put uh, we make baka like render it down, but we do it like I don't want to say French style because baka like came from uh, you know French people, you know. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we do add a little bit of red wine, but the fun part is it, it's still a baka, right? With all the uh, five spice, the star anise, the cloves, and um, we do a pastry shell over it and we stick a bone marrow through it. And so it comes out like really, really fun. And we actually light up a rosemary coming to the table. So I love to um, yeah. show Vietnamese fun flavors, but also the visuals and also play with all your senses. So you're smelling the rosemary, you're feeling the holidays before you even dig into the dish. So that's one thing that we love to do uh, at recess is really play with all of your senses. You know, these sessions, these episodes, when I talk to people, these are not, we're not trying to pitch you a restaurant. We're not trying to sell you. We're not, I, I do, I bring on people because I'm just interested in the process of what you do. Um, and then as a, as a byproduct, obviously people are interested in, in the, in the restaurant or the brand, but I'm very interested in the way, you know, you, you go about uh, doing the work that you do. I, I have so much respect for infusing the Vietnamese culture in your food. It's uh mm -hmm. it's, it's mind blowing. Tell me about the bone marrow. Um, I, I want to know more. I don't know a whole lot of, about bone marrow other than the fact that I love eating it, but uh, can you tell me how it was brought into your menu? And then we'll get into the science behind the health of it and, and a bunch of other things that my mom mm -hmm. talks to me about all the time. Sure. Um, well, bone marrow has always been on our menu since day one. Basically, any gastro pub you go to, there'll be a bone marrow somewhere on the, the menu. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants, Bistro. I think their most popular dish is their bone marrow pasta. Mm -hmm. um, they make like a, their bone marrow pasta no, at no, Bestia. I, I missed it. At Bestia in downtown LA. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, they, they scrape out the bone marrow into the pasta and it makes it very creamy, buttery, and they mix it all up. And that's one of everyone's favorite dishes. But bone marrow is on basically all crafty restaurants uh, some, in one form or another. So a funny story is my – my one of my partners, uh, Victor, he decided, why don't we do a bone marrow mac and cheese? Uh, for me, I was thinking, oh, that's probably not a great idea because you're putting fat on more fat on more cream. It doesn't sound that great. Uh, but somehow it took media by storm. It, it, customers love it. And it's been on our menu ever since. Actually, if you Google bone marrow mac and cheese, I believe we're all over um, the whole world because I don't think anyone else would do it. But it's so popular here that we couldn't take it off. Amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And then you guys do a bone marrow uh, burger or something too, right? Yeah, we, we have a lot of bone marrow. Uh, we do a bone marrow burger where like, you know, you cook the bone marrow, you scrape it onto the, the meat and just, it's like a beef butter, if you will. So we don't, we don't do like a, a butter spread. The butter comes from the, the bone marrow. So it has a more beefy, more unctuous flavor. Yeah. Yeah. What? And, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say the health benefits, right? Mm -hmm. It's funny that said that because my mom and I still have this conversation all the time. I tell her to research it, Google it, ask your doctor, whatever. Bone marrow is good for you. Bone marrow is it's not like it is fat. It's almost pure fat, but it's like um, a fat that helps regulate diabetes. It helps digestion. I know this too because I Googled it. I tell my mom this all the time because she will never eat bone marrow. And when she makes it for pho, she <laughs> often just... I'm sorry. They toss it out. Yeah, they toss it out. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, give that to me, you know. And she's like, no, I don't want you eating pure fat. But um, it's good for you in moderation, for sure. It's just like I don't want to compare it to like omega fats. But um, when you eat salmon, you know, it's good to eat the skin. You know, it's good to eat uh, fish fat. Yeah, oh, sorry about that. that. No, no worries. Yeah, I, I, it's so funny. I have this debate with my mom too. We constantly talk about. It. I just broke my leg about a month ago, and. Mm -hmm. um, so she's made uh, pho broth for me every day. Uh, I mean, she's made a pot a week, and then I'll just go through two or three meals as I've been in bed recovering. And um, the bone marrow comes out. And I'm like, in the, in the first batch, she threw it all out. I said, hey, mom, where's the bone marrow? I think bone on, for bone, for, for broken bones is going to help me. He said, no, 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 it's really bad for you. So that's why I, I got to talk to you about this today. You've done the research, and, you know, so is it all fat, or what is it? 
Okay, so it's uh, mostly fat. It has, I want to say, like 15% protein in it, but it has like a ton of vitamins. Vitamin, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to tell you the exact vitamins, but it has a lot of vitamins that's more than the actual protein meat itself. But seriously, wow. I encourage people to look up bone marrow. It's it's good for you in moderation, for sure. Yeah, I, I love it. I seek it out. Um, I, so I had her just the second batch she made. She uh, took out all the bone marrow and cut up the tendons and chopped it all up. So she would just make the pho broth with all of the bone marrow, the, the tendons, the extra meat on the bones, and she'll clean out the meat and put it in um, uh, the batch for me every time. Yeah. I think I've improved my, my, my recovery has been um, really 100% because of, of my mom's uh, okay. mom, <laughs> pho broth, yeah. You, you have a very close relationship with your mom. I do. Uh, I grew up like just in the restaurant business and my mom always like, I was always around my mom and my grandfather a, a ton, but uh, we're very close because um, she's actually here right now uh, helping me do the uh, weekend event. Um, but I'm close with my mom because she is like obsessive in what she does too. And I'm the only one out of my siblings that like just keep constantly want to improve and want to keep working. And, and I don't care if I'm working in like seven days a week, eight days a week. It doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm there until like my, I reach what I'm trying to do. And I, f I feel we're very similar in that it's regard. It's like game recognized game, right? <laughs> I know. That's what, that's what I think. I, ho I hope to be like her, you know? So. Are your other siblings as close to her as you? Or are you, are you probably the, 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 your favorite, your mom's favorite son? We're all pretty close to my mom. I just feel like uh, professionally, we're we're more in tune to each other. So this idea of, I don't know if it's a Vietnamese thing, but I, I'd like to explore it, right? Like I'm very close to my mom. Is it something that you were always proud of growing up? Or was there a time that you were embarrassed and then one day became like, oh my God, I'm so proud of it? Because I'll tell you how I felt about that. Um, you know, I, I see my friends like uh, get a little embarrassed, like when their mom kisses them when they were younger. I was never embarrassed by that. I always loved my mom. I always enjoyed her giving me kisses and dropping me off to school or whatever. So, you know, I enjoy, I love our relationship. Do you have a stigma that, you know, your mom's in the kitchen or, you know, backing you up at your business? Do you ever think like uh, people look at it and go, you know, I'm asking again from a selfish place because I I've gone through that. Um, uh -huh. embarrassment like you know growing up in the window coverings business it's like I always have this insecurity it's like oh well my mom is the one who started it and I'm kind of the one who <laughs> my mom and dad and then my dad passed away and then I took over the business but it was always kind of like embarrassing because it's like not because I'm embarrassed of my mom I'm embarrassed of like the fact that well she started it and not really I started you're in a different situation because you started the recess room right yeah, um, for my mom, like we don't work together at the recess room because we butt heads like crazy. Oh, uh, nice. uh, the time that we do, she's like, "Why? Why do you do that? Why do you have to?" It's blasphemy to do stuff like that. So I understand that, you know, like older generation, they're very, very traditional. They're very like purists of the food form. Uh, for our generation, I think we're always out there looking for what's fun, what's exciting. Um, so we don't really work together during uh, for recess. She's here right now because she's helping with our uh, weekend events that we do for charity. So and, and we have to rely on her to do that because she's the only one that can really do like real Vietnamese food because we do all ethnic Vietnamese foods. And um, she's a killer at it. She's like she's like five people in one, you know, and it's all volunteer based. So I need her more than ever now. How did you get into that? The um... uh, the charity? Yeah. Um, uh, it's funny. Uh, I think the very first shutdown, I believe it was on March 18th um, of last year. And uh, on March 20th, we decided to do a uh, food for seniors uh, drive where they can uh, pull up and, uh, you know, just get uh, a meal for free. And we did that because, well, one, obviously we wanted to help the community. There's a lot of seniors that are stuck and they don't have caretakers because everyone's scared of COVID. They don't know what it is. They're, everyone's acting like it's AIDS. Everyone's afraid to like even get close to anybody. And if you have it, there's like, oh my God, how did you get it? You're so dirty. You know, <laughs> something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but we have, our restaurant's huge and uh, we're always quite busy. So we had a huge stockpile of fresh food. All of our food here is pretty much fresh. We have one walk-in freezer that has like nothing in it. We don't have carry anything inside the walk-in freezer besides ice cream and uh, ice, so, some like block ice that we make. Um, 
So I wasn't going to let all that fresh food go to waste for sure. So I sent out uh, our, on our Instagram and our Facebook that we have a food drive for seniors that really need help during this time where their caretakers um, didn't abandon them, but they're not, they're no longer able to take care of them because of COVID. Right. And coming from Fountain Valley, a very high senior population, it just seemed to work out well. So when we first did that, it was mostly geared towards Fountain Valley locals, which consists of a lot of uh, older Caucasians. Uh, there's a lot of Asians, too. But I feel most of the people that came were Caucasians. And we got such huge uh, community support, uh, community love that I, I found that I was so fulfilled at what we're doing. We're all sitting here um, as restaurant owners and other business owners sitting there at home doing nothing because you can't go out. There's no business going on and everyone's afraid of what's going on too. Yeah. So I do, I remember clearly when I drove to work, there wasn't even like 10 cars that I saw. And I live like six miles away from work. And there's a barely like 10 or 15 cars that I saw on the way to work. And everyone's just super, super scared. And I wasn't going to put myself in a position where I'm going to be at home doing nothing. I want to go out there and do something positive for sure. When did you have that thought? How far into COVID? You know, did, did you uh, it was it was sure. yeah it was two days um after the uh, close down so march 20th because of the stockpile of food and once we uh, finished the stockpile of food um i loved what we did so much i was uh i met uh tam nguyen and so he was doing uh his own thing doing nailing it for america which was giving pvps um food to like healthcare workers we connected somehow and we just formed a team to really take care of the community. And through that, it, we got so much community love and it just, everything was just going in the right direction and I haven't stopped since. Okay, so let's backtrack here. March, you get the word, <laughs> you gotta shut down. Is that how it how <laughs> So you're like literally January, February, it's probably gangbusters, business is great, your <laughs> business were four years. March happens, what happens? It shuts down all of a sudden and then you have a pantry full of fresh foods. Is that how, how this went? Yes. Okay. Then the pantry full of fresh foods, you're like, okay, let me put this and use social media to put the word out. Correct. And then what happens right after that? So we start serving the community, the local community, just Fountain how Valley. Do you know what to serve? And I think we did that. What was the concept? Oh, what did we serve? Yeah. Oh, we were serving the seniors that weren't being taken care of. Yeah. But how did you know what? to make, what kind of food to make for the seniors? We served um, whatever we had in the pantry. We just made sure that there was enough carbs, uh, protein, and veggies. So I just created a complete meal that was very restaurant recess room quality. And I do have a lot of background in nutrition and healthy foods. So I knew um, the dietary restrictions that I would want to stick to for people that are over 55 years old. So we, we made a really healthy food, fun food for these seniors. And uh, we did it for about, I want to say four weeks um, in a row. And that's where I met other business professionals and we started doing other things. Okay, so you're four weeks into it, but I guess the thought of like a rent, uh, you have to pay rent, you have to pay your people. Yeah. Did that come across in your mind? Like, okay, well, we're going to transition over here. We're going to pivot to make, to do this charity work. But what about who's paying your rent? Who's keeping the lights on? Right. Regardless if I do this or, uh, or don't do it, we're paying rent regardless. We're, we're still paying our square footage rent. We're still doing all those things. So I figured like if I'm paying rent anyway, um, I might as well utilize the, the space. And so I reached out to all of our staff. I said, guys, um, I can't really pay you for what we used to do because there's no business. Yes, we did takeout, but that was like less than 1% of what we normally do. Wow. Our food style is not for takeout yeah. no one's gonna order like 150 dollar um, tomahawk steak to go you know um we our food wasn't ready for for takeout on that fast and so uh, i reached out to um, our chefs and whoever was down to really mostly volunteer their time and work uh, through this pandemic together then we'll do it and so we started getting a lot of donations for people that came to keep to keep feeding the seniors so we used those donations to pay our staff members it was by no means ready to pay anything of rent, not even like 5% of rent. So we knew that we were going to be stuck in a pickle for sure. And so we just wanted to do some good instead of staying at home and being depressed and sleeping all day. Did you reach out to your landlord and let them know, hey, 
like we're, we're not going to make it. Yeah. So, um, we weren't sure how long this, uh, close down was going to be. I didn't know. I, I felt like it was going to be one week, two weeks. I think it ended up being two or three months, uh, for the first time. And, um, I did talk to our landlord and, uh, the stories are all very similar. It's landlord based base to base like the case to case i mean um the most of them were like oh you know just hang through it let's work it out let's wait till ppp comes along so all the stories are quite similar in regards to that so you go through it the first time right and then so you're making all this food <laughs> and charity donations are coming in more and more right right um do you refine the menu? Do you find out that, oh, you know, it's like all oh, white people or Mexican people or how do you know, figure out the demographics and how do you know what to make and how does this all transpire? Yeah. So um, when we first did it with our initial uh, test group, um, we just made uh, more American style food. Um, and it since it's free, I don't see any seniors coming really complaining about what the food is because it's, it's basically free food and it's a uh, restaurant quality meals. So we didn't have any complaints or any difficulty doing that. Um, but if, uh, in regards to what we're doing now, which we changed the, the food to Vietnamese style foods, it's cause I was approached by, uh, by Tam Nguyen, uh, working through nailing it and understanding a lot about more about the Vietnamese community. I, th I thought I knew a lot about it, but until I met. Tam, he really um, schooled me on all what, what goes on. And uh, basically right now, um, still going on, there's so many Vietnamese seniors that don't receive any help. Um, as a combination of, you know, politics, um, a combination of Vietnamese people being humble and not telling anybody about their situation. Uh, they're not vocal about what's going on. So, but then we all know that everyone's going through trouble. So, you know, we thought about serving Vietnamese seniors. Uh, mostly. And uh, yes, there's meals on wheels, there's food banks, there's second harvest. But imagine giving, let's say, your grandparents or your older mother or father um, what these pantries usually give you. Here's a can of Spam, a, can of, uh, uh, a lot of canned foods and some rice aroni and uh, good luck, right? What do, you, what do you, um, you know, Vietnamese seniors do? It's not Vietnamese ethnic uh, food and they end up just giving it away. They don't really eat it or oatmeal. You know, a lot of Vietnamese people don't eat oatmeal, but that would be part of the package or cheese. Like, what are you going to do with that stuff? Right. And so we ended up started uh, deciding that we're going to be doing very Vietnamese centric foods and we're going to serve the Vietnamese uh, community. Um, this doesn't close down, uh, you know, any, uh, ethnicities if you're white if you're a mexican you you sign up there's no questions asked we actually have such an easy criteria there's no like let me see your id show mm -hmm. me your paperwork it's an honor system you know like if you're 55 and above you're automatically qualified we work with a nonprofit via care that takes care of this uh ton he's an amazing uh logistics person he takes care of all of this all the criteria but let's say that you're not 55 and above let's say you're 18 years old and you're just in a in a jam we don't turn you away. You show up and you get a free hot meal. No questions asked. And this doesn't, um, how we make all this food and we don't get money uh, funded from the government or anything. And that's what a lot of people think. We do it as a collective uh, business professionals. You know, a bunch of, uh, there's a lot of us that put all this together to make it work. God, I'm speechless <laughs> for the first time during the show. Like, <laughs> No, I got to have nothing to say. I'm just so um, touched by the actions of the of you and Thumb and the community. Of uh, uh, it, it is very moving to to hear that you're doing this work. Yeah. So um, the cool thing about this is when we first started, right? Um, we started doing 50 meals uh, on each event, and then it jumped up to 300 right away, 400, 500. We went up to even 800 at one point. Um, but all those numbers was just uh, numbers to me because I was in the kitchen helping my family prepare them. We'd pass it out to the volunteers and they take it on their routes um, or part of the drive through, you know. But the numbers didn't really mean anything to me. I was like happy that we provided higher numbers, but it was just all a number, 801, 802, all the same thing until, until I went on a delivery route myself one weekend. I delivered maybe um, to 12 homes, to 12 families. And... Every single one of them has a different story. And I still remember like what it meant to me. Uh, it, it tears me up a little bit, just how, how much it meant to them. 
and how much it meant to me to take care of them and how much this one just simple meal means to them because a lot of there's like huge huge problems going on uh, especially in the senior community like uh financially mentally um and especially not being able to see anybody um we see a lot of people that uh, Tam goes on routes every single week and he tells me the story that touches me all the time he serves to an older Vietnamese gentleman and when he comes he tells Tam like this is the the happiest moment of my whole week you're the only person I see the whole week he invites them in talks to them, just talks like, oh, have you seen this show or the news or the weather? It's about the communication. It's about the human interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the food itself. It's the soul that we're feeding. I'm going to let that sink in for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so funny, uh, sidetrack here. So when, uh, Tam was telling me that a lot of the volunteers that do the deliveries, we do deliveries because there's a lot of seniors that don't have any caretakers whatsoever or any family members that will go pick up the food for them. By the way, if you're a senior, you can actually send your son, your daughter, or your caretaker, or whatever, to pick up the food. We don't ask for ID. We don't. It's all honor based, right? But a lot of the times that we do the deliveries, these um these seniors will. Uh, we'll ask like certain favors because they, they have no one around. Like, um, we'll move some of their furniture for them. We'll take out their trash. It's like little things like this. It's weird. It's like we're not like a, a formal um, a coalition, if you will. It's like so informal. It's just a, a bunch of business leaders that came together and say, hey, we're going to do good for the community. How many people are part of the operation directly and indirectly now from drivers to people in the kitchen to organizers <laughs> on the logistics side? There's a, there's a ton. So I would say uh, we call our operation uh, Operation Moving Forward Together. So it's a group of all, uh, different businesses, uh, Advanced Beauty College, Recess Room, Moving Forward, Psycho Psychological Institute, uh, Unity Cafe, a lot of uh, business professionals. They come together. We all take care of our own uh, parts. And I would say um, in general, there's always about like eight people, eight core people that work on this daily. Um, and think about logistics and all that stuff. But when the weekend happens or the, the day of the event, there's a good 30 to 50 volunteers every single time. So it's a huge, huge event. And it's really, really, excuse me, fun and exciting because I see new faces every single time. So you could just take volunteers from, you know, what, like a website or how they call it? Yeah. How does it work? There's an Eventbrite link. Um, I can send it to you later, uh, but there's a link where you can sign up and it'll give you dates, what's available, but it's really, really amazing to see um, all the younger kids, the younger generation. I'm talking about like high school kids yeah. that show up, that their parents will drop them off. When I see that, it makes me uh, so proud, you know, to see that. But um, there's a lot of uh, younger kids. There's a lot of like older generations too that come out and just doing something more meaningful, more, more purposeful. We actually have... Um, you know, I, I don't even want to use the word homeless. We have homeless people that show up that aren't just even asking for food. They just want to do something. They want to do something meaningful for their life. And when I see that, it just makes it seem like we can't stop what we're doing. How has that affected your regular business? Are you guys back on the regular business track or has this charity thing taken over <laughs> entirely? No. So um, we, we keep it separate. Um, all of the staff that we have uh, for recess room, they're completely separate. They don't do, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the charity event. The charity event is basically ran by all volunteers. The food itself is like, uh, my mom leads that. Uh, my aunts and uncles come out, my cousins, cousins, friends, whatever it is. And so it's completely separate from recess room. Um, but that's why we come in so early the day of, because we only open for dinner time during recess uh, hours, which is like uh, 5 p.m. and above. So we'll utilize the morning time to create the hot meals and we do the event right after the hot meals are made. Does that create chaos in the kitchen? Like if the volunteers don't clean up well enough or logistically, uh, operationally? Right. It's funny that you asked that because I, no one's ever asked me that single question before, but yes, it creates a lot of chaos. Um, some of the cooks get really annoyed by this person not cleaning up out of themselves or vice versa or not doing it fast enough or using their burner longer than whatever. But luckily, we have a really huge kitchen, but still, it, it's it's really cramped in here. Um, at any time, we have probably 20 people in the kitchen, like uh, 12 of them being the volunteers working for the, the other event, the other eight to 10 being for recess. So they're always like in each other's ways. But in the end of the day, like to me, uh, that's a. Uh, that's just a second, uh, second thought because uh, the bigger picture is taking care of the, 
the people that need it. And this is uh, meals every day for for the seniors. So we used to do it every single Sunday, um, but we had to. We recently changed it to every other Sunday because uh, the volunteers were like dwindling out. It's really hard to see volunteers to do it more than two to three times a, a week. I mean, a, a month. Um, but uh, that's why we spaced it out. And plus, it was hard on us too, as a restaurant owner, to keep uh, buying um, all the three. So basically, every time we do this, I need about 200 pounds of protein. I need three bags of rice, 150 pounds. I need eight cases of fresh vegetables. Uh, I need about 50 pounds of soy sauce or um, uh, fish sauce every single time. Shout out to Danny, Sun's Fish Sauce, which he provided. I don't even know how many pallets so far. Um, but we use this fish sauce for all of the events um, and, and for recess too. Uh, but if we didn't have uh, the people that came together to help, there's no way that we can front the bill. So we do leverage a lot of the, um, the uh, uh, distributors that let them know that we're doing this for good deeds. But in the end of the day, we still have to pay off our own pocket. But um, it, it's for something that's uh, a great cause, better than uh, self, uh, you know, financial gain. How long can you sustain this for? I'm going to do it till the wheels fall off. Shit, man. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. Once. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, we have uh, indefinitely uh, plans to do this indefinitely. Um, just the what we've done for the community and what we've done for the individuals that we deliver, I cannot see myself deciding not to do it, you know? What about having a separate, I mean, you ever thought of having a separate kind of operation where you can continue uh, doing this maybe in a kitchen that's uh, a defunct restaurant or, or anything like setting up some independent or are you yeah. going to piggyback this one? No. So um, that's definitely the direction. But in the end of the day, I feel none of us have that experience. Um, we just got into the nonprofit understanding about the nonprofit. We don't even actually have a person that asks for donations. We know that's not one of the things that we do. We don't ask people for donations like crazy. If people do want to donate, they can. So um, I guess we should, you know, to get, get uh, be able to do this for the long run. But, you know, we're just going to keep doing it because we always find a way to keep um, making the event stronger and, uh, and keep going. It's, it's really great, too, because a lot of the Vietnamese companies, like Jelly Me, um, they'll come and they'll uh, – They'll come and they'll deliver a bunch of their uh, jelly products. We'll include it or like a, a mask company or a gloves company. We, we had so many uh, different uh, companies come in and donate uh, stuff that we can give to the seniors. But all in all, it's all about making their life more fulfilled, their life, life more meaningful, and th their life having that understanding that there's people here that care for them. Because I feel like during this time, especially during COVID, these seniors feel abandoned. They feel like no one cares about them, you know? I mean, look no further. I don't even have to look to the seniors. I mean, I feel that way. And I'm like, you know, I'm just a regular person who's an able-bodied yeah. person. I feel abandoned. I feel uh, helpless during this whole time. Um, so I can't imagine what our community's older um, population feel, the, the elders. And I can't, as I'm listening to you, uh, I realize what kind of work um effort is involved in putting something like this together and not and and trying to figure out how do you sustain something like this going into the future or the next year you know you might burn out i mean to the wheels fall out that's a yeah yeah, yeah. um well um the idea can we get a charger sorry i'm getting another uh, charger pack <laughs> no worries no worries yeah um the idea is to definitely sustain it. So it kind of segues into uh, my mom's business right now. So uh, my mom pretty much retired um, last year. You know, we still ran her vegetarian restaurant, which is in Huntington Beach. It's called Bodhi Tree Vegetarian Cafe. Um, she's had that for like 16, 17 years. And um, sorry, just give me one second. No problem. Through the, the box we made. <laughs> so, um, you know, during uh, COVID, um, our restaurant, we didn't, we weren't able to get a decent PPV package over there. So my mom and sister were just like, you know, maybe it's time to just call it quits. 
Um, but that restaurant has been in our family for like 16, 17 years. I was like still in college when we had that restaurant. So I can't imagine like that just going away. I expected that to be in our family for a very, very long time. And we've been a staple in that area. We're really close to the pier. Um, so we have a huge following and people that love us. It's a very, very small restaurant, mom and pop style restaurant, but we just couldn't figure a way out how to, to make it work. So, you know, my partners and I, we decided to, to take it over. We decided to rescue it, if you will. Uh, rebrand it. It's called Good Vibes Plant Based Cafe mm. right now. Uh, it's a juice bar, a salad bar, but we're also doing vegan food, but like next level vegan food. I want to say like the vegan food that like you know people our age are looking for, like really really fun surf city style. But one of the things that how we carry over our good deeds, the reason why we changed Good Vibes is because we're sending good vibes out from recess right now, and we all thought about it, it like let's call it Good Vibes uh, Cafe. Right. So it's called Good Vibes. And one of the cool um, things that we are coming out with once it opens in a couple of weeks is that we have a one item on the menu every single day that uh, it changes every single day. It will be, let's say, baka or like some type of stew, rice, veg, carbs, protein that an individual can order. But you pay it forward. So it's a pay it forward meal, if you uh, will. I think we call it a soul bowl soul bowl or bowl for the soul or something like that but um it's uh no questions asked you you can pay zero dollars to to have that meal you can pay two dollars you can pay twenty dollars or you don't even have to order that meal you can pay it forward for somebody so you're paying it forward like if i was a customer and i saw i've been to one of these restaurants where they do pizza slices okay. like that i'll order a pizza and they'll be like buy a pizza slice for somebody and it's just one dollar you put your name on a little tag you put it on the wall yep. and somebody can come in and re uh, redeem that if they're down on their luck and don't have the money at the time or, you know, just need a helping hand. So it's it's very similar to that style. I actually saw that at a restaurant in uh, Singapore, and it's always carried with me ever since I've seen it when I was a little kid. But uh, that's something that we're recreating. Um, so it's almost like a pay it forward meal. So that's something that's definitely sustainable. It's beautiful. Imagine if you did that at recess. Uh, we'll put an old fashioned, uh, you know. <laughs> For, you know, or a beer or an IPA. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, this this whole idea of like to the wheels fall off. Um, how long do you think this COVID stuff is going to be affecting our restaurants? So it's tough. Re uh, people ask me this all the single time. Uh, every time uh, restaurant business, it's probably one of the worst businesses to be in right now. Um, everybody knows that. That's no secret. Um but the way to survive this uh, is to be small, be very, very small, be um, have low labor, um, have very low um, your mortgage, you know, your, your rent. You know, that's difficult to change because if you're already in a lease, yeah. you can't change that. Looking to open up a new restaurant, be small. Um, I think recess is probably the worst restaurant to be in because we're 6,500 square feet. Um, our rent is insane. And that's it's even insane when our, uh, we're packed out the door. And right now it's like nothing. There's nobody here. So we have to figure out ways to survive this. And I feel um, definitely helping the community. We've gotten so much support from, from everybody. And I feel uh, that's definitely one step in the right direction. Is your, so, your seating open? Yeah. So funny that you say that. Um, we have a huge parking lot. We set up two party tents. All right. They're like, 20 by 30 feet two of them and i have an existing patio so we can see almost 200 people outdoors but this year when the winds came uh, it blew apart our tents like completely like to trash right and each tent i would say cost about a thousand dollars they're like pretty uh pretty you know heavy duty but the winds were so strong that it blew it away when the uh blew away the first tent we the next day we went to go rebuild it uh we bought a new one put it together. Um, and in a couple of weeks, I want to say two or three weeks later, both of them blew up. So I feel in a way like we're always being tested, right? I feel um, we're always being tested to see how resilient we are. And this is part of like, when you ask me, like, what does it mean to be Vietnamese? I feel like we're very resilient people. We always find a way to make it work. So literally, if anything were to happen tomorrow, I'm just like, I'm ready to go. If the restaurant burns down tomorrow, I'll be at Home Depot buying wood and nails. Let's build it again. So that's my mentality coming through COVID and what uh, it, it made me grow as a person. Wow. So you're really going to swing for the fences. You're going to try to keep this going. Definitely. 
And are you, is the, are the tents back up again? I'm sorry. I didn't. One of them, one of them's up right now, but we did come up with a, uh, a different style of tent where it's more, uh, more mesh covering. So yeah. if the wind do come, it doesn't create that little, uh, you know, that panel that blows over. And you guys are open. Um, I'm asking this because I'm, I'm going to take my wife down. I won't let you know when, but I'm going to take her down and, and come pay for the food and support. And then I'll call you. We, yeah, we open for dinner uh, every day of the week except Mondays. Yeah. And has that changed from your regular working operating hours? Like, did you guys used to open for lunch or? Yeah, we did. We opened for lunch. Sorry about that. Give me one second. We opened for lunch. Oh, give me one second. Okay. We opened for lunch before um, before COVID, but right now everybody's working at home. And in Found Valley, there's a lot of corporations that are around, but no one's working in them right now. Um, so it didn't make sense for us to open for lunch and lose more money through uh, labor. So we decided to um, push it all into dinner. And it's still, it's still okay. It's just when we're only able to do takeout is the problem. Um, but if we do have dine-in, people still order some drinks, beers, cocktails, whatever, which makes up a lot of sales for us. And what about your employees? Are they suffering because of the, the lack of hours that they can work or how are they managing? Definitely. Um, it's, it stands me to say we had a furlough, maybe over 70% of our staff. Uh, we've only kept like the core management, the core people that have been through with us since the beginning. Um, but a lot of the uh, other workers, we, we weren't able to, to keep. But um, one thing that I'm very excited about is like I, everyone that's sticked with us, we've all learned to be resilient. We've all learned to be harder workers and um, keep things alive. You know, so I'm very, very uh, motivated. I'm very happy to see what's uh, what's upcoming for us. Yeah, the love is probably deeper now with the um, with the team, right? Oh, definitely, one hundred percent. Going through that kind of adversity makes you gel even stronger. Yeah, the conversations that we'll have as a group, we've never had these type of conversations. It's like thinking about how do we, you know, hedge ourselves for the week coming. I think uh, uh, it'll be oh, you know, the the cases are rising. We got to prepare to be slower, you know, or the, we got to prepare to have it shut down again, you know. So every single day we're learning to pivot, and and it, it's kind of fun in a in a way because every day is something different. We have new conversations, we have new ideas, and everyone's brainstorming like it's their last day. So that sense of urgency makes us stronger. What's your personal thoughts of um, the state of California and the way they're handling? Uh, the restaurants and the COVID pandemic. It's weird. Um, it, it's a it's a tough uh, pickle to be honest. I, I don't think uh, there's any real right way. It's just how things are are there. Like I don't understand. Like for restaurants, right? Like how come like we can't open, but like you can go into malls and malls have like a t right. But then at the same time, I don't want to argue that we should be able to open and cause more of a problem for COVID. You know what I mean? But at the same time, I don't like seeing that. We, we can't open, but other people, like very similar situations can open. It doesn't make, doesn't make real sense. So I feel like not that we're a target, but we're on the bottom end of all of this for sure. Well, it's a, it's a messy debate because, you know, on mm. the one hand, we know, you know, we know how vital uh, small businesses are for uh, the, the, the locale that we're living in. You know, it's everything. It, small businesses drive it. But at the same time, we don't want to spread this um, this pandemic, and it puts us all in a pickle. We're constantly trying to mitigate the the risk and the fear and the the way of life that we we used to have. I don't um, I don't envy it. I um, I feel for what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, tough and it's a challenge every day. But at the same time, like I'm the type of person where I always look at the more positive. Uh, notes in my day I was looking at the more positive things like Valentine's Day is coming up I know that we're gonna be really busy and so like I'm excited to do a new fun menu like I'm able to block out a lot of the negative noise uh, but when I find myself thinking about it that's where things start uh, spiraling out of control so for me it's definitely like keeping my mindset strong yeah keep staying in the present moment and dealing with whatever is at hand first right um, I don't know exactly. if I asked this earlier but are you um thinking about uh going harder on the on the do on the food uh the um, charity side more or are you kind of like plateauing with the units that you're doing right now um 
I feel um, if we have the funds to do more uh, volume, I would love to. You know, like I feel like every single individual that can benefit from this is just an overall plus for the community. But uh, I think at the numbers, 500-ish, uh, every time, every event is pretty good at what we're doing because at that time, I still have to keep in mind of the, my own food costs, my own, uh, well, labor, we don't really pay because it's all family. It's all like uh, volunteers, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll have to buy the hundreds of pounds of meat, rice, vegetables, mm -hmm. boxes, or boxes. Uh, um, we spend a lot of money on like containers, you know, bags, things like that. So, um, you know, I have to keep it a little you know, doable for us. But I think 500 to 700 is a good number for us. Is there um, a call to action for somebody to step up uh, who can kind of manage this side of your life where they can sort of uh, do the fundraising, you know, manage the volunteer? I mean, just <clears throat> maybe a duplicate of who you are and mm -hmm. just sort of scale it up because it sounds like it's really needed in our community. Yeah, so... um we, uh, for our group, we just know that we need somebody that can actually really fundraise. And the funding, it doesn't even have to go to the volunteers or anything. I think it's just all about paying for the food costs uh, because that's what the money is coming out uh, to pay for. Or like the gas for the volunteers, I would love to cover the volunteers' gas to make those deliveries. But literally, like, um, that's probably our weakest area, but a call to action for someone to come in and help uh, fundraise, that would be great. But at the same time, like I said, Vietnamese people, we're very, we're very humble. We don't like knock on doors and, and, you know, ask or beg for, for funds. So we haven't really reached out to, you know, um, our local uh, city council and things like that to really, really push for funding. We've mentioned it, but it's not one of the things that's high on our priority. High on priority is actually doing what we do and feeding the, the seniors. Yeah, but it seems like, you know, you're getting all this press, right? And if you had like a collecting sort of like a website, a GoFundMe or something that can run yeah. for the months, ask yeah. them 50 grand, some, uh, you know, decent number and have somebody, some young college kid put it together and every yeah. time you do Good Day LA or you get on to a, um, uh, a podcast or something, you have a, a place to collect it. Yeah, that would be a great idea. You know, um, that's one thing that, uh, you know, after speaking to you, I'm going to make sure that we talk about it and make it work by next week to so maybe just try a GoFundMe, you know, just do something very low amount. And, and we should probably put on a, a, a value of like, say, oh, let's raise $5,000. This Absolutely. is going to be 10,000 meals or whatever, you know, and that's probably what we should, should be doing. But uh, yeah, that's a great idea. If you have that LA Times article that, you know, then you have that GoFundMe page and then they printed that and it would just... Yeah. And you'd be, you'd go viral. And because what you are doing is so important. Is there anybody else in Orange County that's doing what you do? Yeah, there, there is uh, one of uh, persons like I, I met, Bill Bracken. So it's Bracken's Kitchen. He's amazing. He's done like, I don't know the amount, but it's like millions of meals this year. But he's been doing this for 15, 17 years, a very, very long time. Uh, but, you know, he mentored me on how to really feed the community and uh, how to do it smart and how to do it uh, feasible. Um, so we learned through him uh, a lot what to do. Wow. Shout out to Bill. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Besides, besides Bill, I don't know uh, any other restaurant. Um, that does this. Bill set up a nonprofit, so he has a whole warehouse and a huge kitchen, like you wouldn't even imagine. But um, but he he does that. And so basically, we're trying to do emulate his style, emulate his model, and do it for the Vietnamese community. Beautiful, yeah. And what I hope down the road is people get a wind of this conversation, and then it can create like something in Houston or something in San Jose, where there's other. <clears throat> Uh, people that could do work like you. Yeah, you know, um, let me tell you a really uh, fun story about what you just said, real quick. Uh, so, Tam, when he was doing Nailing It for America, you've heard of Nailing It for America, right? Mm -hmm. So, when he was doing that, um, for April 30th, we decided to give back to the community, showing uh, some love, a day of mo normal mourning for Vietnamese uh, Americans. Instead of mourning that day, we wanted to really change the, the mindset, change the thinking, and say, hey, Let's not mourn today. Let's do something positive. Let's go and get together as a community and give, give back uh, to the community and, um, sorry, um, give back and uh, do it collectively. And so when we when we did that, it was uh, it was only like maybe ten local restaurants in Westminster. 
uh, or in Orange County. And um, Tam had a brilliant idea that why don't we reach out to other Vietnamese communities all over the United States? So this is the coolest yeah. story all the time. So we had seven days to do this. Um, it was like uh, April 23rd. We we're like, how are we going to make it within seven days? So we reached out to Vietnamese communities in Texas, Houston, Austin, uh, Utah. Um, I was speaking to restaurant owners in New York, Florida, um, so many other areas I can't even remember. And we all got together and they asked us like, you know, how are we doing what we do? We said, you know, honestly, we don't know what we're doing. We just put our, we just do it. We just figure it out along the way. So we all came together and said, hey, let's do this as a coalition together uh, in the United States. All Vietnamese uh, restaurants and all Vietnamese uh, uh, businesses come together and take care of healthcare workers. And I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I think just on that day, we did over 70,000 meals to healthcare workers across the United States. Um, I think it was over 2 million uh, PPEs. Uh, it was worth over like $4 million. It was masks, gloves, uh, all that stuff, uh, hand sanitizers, whatever. But it was a day of like something completely positive and uh we hope to do it again this year but not just nationwide but worldwide that's a beautiful um story mm -hmm. of reframing a story yes yes why, why keep harping on the the morning why keep harping on the dark darkness of it all create some wonderful meaningful events from the day of of, of such darkness mm -hmm. when i listen to your story and everyone else that come on to um, our podcast and I hear the depth of your experience and sort of like trying to figure it out. It's messy and you, you know, you're figuring it out. And then five years from now, there could be a massive movement on what you and them started um, along with the other people that I know that you guys are working with. And I'm so proud to hear about the development of what you're doing in the community. Um, do you have any hopes to go beyond the food thing for now, or you're just going to be staying within the food sector for this? No. Um, yeah, I have huge hopes to do um, all different aspects to help the community for sure. Uh, I'm just doing what I know how to do best. Uh, Tam's doing what he knows how to do best. Everyone's doing their own little part. It's just, I happen to be in the restaurant industry. So I can, I know how to work the food. I know how to get things at a very, very low cost and make it very, very special. Um, so we're all doing things that we know, but eventually I would love to branch out and do much more greater good than just food. I think about um, Danny, who I've uh, sat with a, a few episodes back and um, think about the relationships that you have with, with, the guys that you've met, the men and women that you've met along the way, how important is this community now to you than before? Honestly, I felt like I knew the community from before COVID, but after COVID, I felt like uh, I didn't know anything about my own community. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that there was this crazy need. I didn't know that there was pockets of areas where there's seniors that are living meal to meal. Vietnamese seniors living meals. I didn't know any of this. I just figured, you know, being in Orange County, everyone's kind of middle class, well off, you know, um, but that's far from the truth. And Tam, he really showed me that, you know, there are tons of seniors, Vietnamese seniors that are struggling day to day. A um, lot of health, mental crisis, a lot of different, um, different things going on. And, you know, if we can just help like if everyone just came together and helped just one little like particle, one little ounce of energy to help, imagine where we would be as a community. So that's my mindset right now. So um, after COVID, I really understand the community much more than I ever did before. Actually, I did, probably didn't know anything before. <laughs> well, you, uh, Danny and Thumb, the three guys that I know right now are doing it. And I think it's a foundation for future work of this kind of um, giving back to the community and our exposure to what's really happening in, in our community. It's, uh, it's a pandemic is a bad thing. Pandemic is a horrible thing. So many people have died from it and experienced hardship. But at the same time, just like the meaning that we've attached to the story of um, that dark day, the day of mourning, we um, can reassign a different meaning. And, exactly. And I'm seeing what you're doing and it inspires me. It inspires, I hope it inspires other people to uh, take action mm -hmm. with whatever um, career trajectory we're, we're, we're part of. Right. You know, um, 
thank you so much for the time that you've spent with me. I want to ask you if there's anything else that you want me to emphasize in our in our um, you know sitting down today. No, um, you 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 said it best in your uh, last sentence. Um, we hope to uh, just inspire other individuals that want to help, but think that their help might not make a difference if it's just one individual, but that's not true. If everyone just helps pick up just one piece of trash in the world right now, imagine how much better, how much cleaner the place would be. That's the mindset that we all have to have, that everyone's self-action is very, very important and does make a difference. I appreciate it. And if you have anybody else in the movement, um, please do let me know. I do want to talk to them and get to know who they are and and get familiar with um, the different people that are are making these sort of good moves in, in our community. It's very important for the Vietnamese around the world to know about it and to kind of live it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there's like a, uh, a good five to six people that are are part of this uh, coalition that we work together daily. We text each other daily what we're going to do. Um, speaking to them, I think you'll find uh, very similar mindsets on what we discussed today, but in different aspects of their own business. But without uh, any one of these individuals, this whole group thing would not work. Um, everyone comes together so selfless, so um, unselfish. And um, it's about just doing the greater good. And, and uh, it's just been the, the best thing that has happened for me this past year thank you again and um i'm sure we're gonna be talking more in the future and i'm gonna come down one day uh to to the recess room and and uh and really enjoy the food it sounds like a, a blast and uh thank you so much and um have a wonderful new year i know you're gearing up for a, a beautiful day today and you're the first guest of of mine for the new year and i'm very thank grateful you. for that and then thank you so much for your time Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a really fun time. I'm really happy to share our stories and I hope to inspire others out there to do the greater good like we've been doing. You've done, yeah, you've done more than what I've actually, I was expecting to to, to hear about today. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll be in touch very soon. Cool. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you.